So um, I'm going to write down a question and see if you can answer that. This class will not be a kind of class where only I speak and you don't speak. You have to speak. Yes, this is my question. What is number three? Does anybody want to answer that? Successor of zero. Okay, so you stopped at zero. Yeah. What is zero? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so uh, his answer is I don't know. Essentially, it's a number on the number line. It's a number on the number line. What is the number line? Yes. So number three is an abstract entity. That doesn't really answer my question, does it? That is just saying that it's an abstract entity doesn't really answer the question. It is abstract, yes. Yes, please. It's a prime number. It's a prime number, okay. But for that, you had to first answer me what is a number. Yes. Yes, anybody else? I'm sure there are many more opportunities to answer this question. Do you understand what is the meaning of three chairs? Yeah. Yes, are there three chairs on the stage right now? No. 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 Okay, so you understand three chairs. Then on those three chairs, three people are sitting. That you understand? So you understand three people, you understand maybe three watches, you understand three blackboards or green boards. But do you understand number three? Uh -huh. It's uh, so you are saying to count things, but uh, counting is the purpose of number three. Yes, that's one of the purposes. Yeah, uh, uh, the way he described it, he said that three is successor of two. So ordering things is another purpose of number three. Yes, zero, first, second, third. Yeah, I mean that's also another purpose of number three. But that doesn't really still answer the question. What is number three? Yes. An abstract identity that defines a specific quantity. Okay, an abstract entity that defines a specific quantity and what quantity is that? Measure. Uh -huh. that, that quantity uh, can be measure of something. Uh, that quantity can be measure of what? Anything we want to use. For. What do you want to use it for? So, cardinality of empty set is zero. Cardinality of empty set is zero. Now we are talking technical things. Yes, fine. So uh, what is cardinality? That we will learn in the course. Very good. Yes, we will definitely learn what is cardinality in the course. But I mean, isn't it embarrassing that you cannot really answer this question at this moment? It's a very simple question. You learnt it in uh, maybe first standard or even before that. But do you, did you ever think about what it is? Well, I, I can ask you, am I wearing a white t-shirt? Yeah. Yes? I mean, it, it can be termed off-white, but white or off-white. So everybody agrees with that? Yes. But what is white? Color. color. What is a color? Huh? Color is a form of representation. It's a form of representation and what kind of representation? So, color is a form of representation of what? Visual, visual representation. Huh? Of See, the, my point is that uh, our teachers, yeah, I was in a similar situation before I learned set theory. I was, uh, so, our primary school teachers and our parents have done an excellent job of convincing us that we understand numbers and colors, even though we don't really understand them, do we? So, our purpose in this course is to take a step back and look at the things that we think we know and ask the questions, do we really know them? Okay. So, so far we haven't really addressed the question, what is number three? 
but the answer is going to be closer to what he said yeah three is successor of two two is successor of one one is successor of zero and what he said that zero is the cardinality of the empty set so actually the notion of cardinality is more fundamental than the notion of number i mean cardinality or how do we count cardinality as i already mentioned three chairs three people right so they are in one to one correspondence and this one to one correspondence class of all the objects is the number 3 okay it's an it's a relation between different types of objects so three chairs three people three hands three watches yeah it's an equivalence class of all the three things to, together that is our number 3 yeah that will be our formal definition of number 3 and for uh, good purposes yeah we ca we cannot always be dealing with this equivalence class yeah so for a good pu purpose we will always choose a nice representative from this equivalence class which we will say it is the set containing 0 1 and 2 yeah i we will talk about it later in the course but today i'm going to give you some motivating questions yeah that's that's the purpose of this part okay so this is my question number 1 now let me ask you question number 2 what is a set yeah the first part of the course is called set theory what is a set all of you have done this in i mean when i was a student it was in 9th grade and 11th grade again so you have done this right yes what's the answer uh, set is a collection of numbers set is a collection of numbers <laughs> okay 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 Le i am going to write down your answers okay so it's a collection of elements what is a collection yes collection is a group of okay yeah collection is a group and yes you already know my question what is a group <laughs> we are not studying abstract algebra here so you will do that in the next semester but what is a group more than one things are put together okay what is a thing okay it's it's becoming too abstract now okay now yeah that's not really right but what is a group it's a group two more things that are together on, on the basis of some identity identity based on the basis of some property perhaps you mean that yes, you sir, collect what? things together on the basis of some property so again you are using the word collection to describe a group but there's some there's some common property that is yes i understand okay so some common property i will write uh, the, these are all keywords yeah these are not really answers so common property uh, is used to collect things together but again a group is a collection of objects which have some common property any other answer somebody here said something yes so there needs to be like i think a primitive <coughs> starting point because why 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 would be like okay so he is saying it's a primitive notion starting point for what for the for for set theory okay so it's a starting point okay so that's a good answer that we don't really have an answer to this question what is a set we don't have an answer we are just going to assume that we know what a set is and then we are going to work with that yeah that's a good enough answer i will give you something on the next slide which will uh, say something more about this okay i have got one more question before we move on give me some examples of functions all of you know functions yeah you have done calculus linear algebra 
differential equations all of you know examples of functions yes we want to answer that trigonometric functions like sin theta and cos theta okay then uh, i i'm just going to write this okay sin theta then any other answers polynomial functions yes any other answer exponential exponential okay okay i'm not going to write logarithms also yeah any other functions a constant function fine a linear function polynomial contains uh, includes linear already yes any other periodic periodic function is that a function i mean are any of these actually functions or they are just properties exactly we have to define the domain what is the domain of a function no no give me an example of a function which has some domain specific domain none of these are functions actually right now they are just rules so sin theta just says that if somebody gives you theta then you can find sin theta but suppose my theta is equal to a an english language letter does that really tell me the value of sin theta so you have to give it some input and then you will get some output so give me one proper example of a function f of x equal to x square x belonging to r f of x equal to x square okay good x square x belonging to r okay yeah notice how i am writing r yeah you all have to practice that if you don't write it you will lose marks real numbers natural numbers integers they all have to be differentiated from their english counterparts right so real numbers are written like this okay is this still a function fx equal to x square x belonging to r what is still missing codomain. codomain very good so now you have to describe that f is a function from real numbers to real numbers and the rule of the function is fx equal to x square now it makes sense this is the first example of a function that we have described so far so don't assume that something that you know you already know it properly i'll give you two more examples okay so i am going to say x mapping to x from rational numbers to rational numbers and x mapping to x from rational numbers to real numbers what do you call the first type of function this type of function what do you call it identity identity function and is the second function also identity function Yeah. yes it is, it is? Yeah. no identity means it has to be defined on the same set so same domain say same codomain and the element goes to itself so this is actually an identity function but we want to differentiate it from the inclusion function okay so identity and inclusion are actually different types of functions and that's where i mean i wanted to highlight the importance of domains as well as codomains right the domains of both these functions are the same the rule is the same but the codomains are different so they are different functions and they are different types of functions so sin theta polynomials exponentials unless you say that you are choose taking values from real numbers or rational numbers or integers whatever you please you uh, you cannot tell me that this is a function okay. so we have to learn this is yet another and perhaps the most important uh, purpose of this course that we have to learn how to speak mathematics properly yeah when we are thinking of a function you should always think of a triple a comma f comma b a comma f comma b okay so a function is always going to be a triple okay uh, yeah let's add one more question to this list mm -hmm. 
what is infinity do you all understand difference between finite and infinite yes, sir. yes but what is infinity Comparison, yes. Comparison of what? With the finite, it is too large with comparison to finite. Okay, so infinite is too large compared to finite, but what is finite then? Too small compared to infinite. <laughs> How do you define finite? It also depends. It also depends. Everything depends on everything else. Yeah, so we don't have an answer. Is there a unique infinity? No, so there are different types of infinities. What kinds of infinities do you know? Countable, countable infinity and uncountable infinity. Is there only one type of uncountable infinity? How many types are there? <laughs> Infinitely many uncountable <laughs> infinities. So again, that doesn't really answer our question, right? What is infinity? So, do you really know what finite is, F finite set? Finite is countable, no. we are putting equivalence uh, between two different things. What is the meaning of countable? You can construct a bijection to the natural numbers. What are natural numbers? If you want to construct a bijection to natural numbers, then what are natural numbers? They are set defined by the piano axioms. Set defined by the piano axioms. Okay, so we are coming very close to yeah, the, the answers that we desire. Right? So, so far, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe the third question was easy. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, explain the importance of uh, speaking mathematics properly. But the first question, second question and fourth question, yeah, they are tricky questions. Actually, so, oh, okay. So, how many of you have uh, watched at least one episode of the Big Bang Theory? Okay, uh, some number, uh, that's quite surprising for this large class. Okay, so Big Bang Theory is, a sh an, is an American sitcom about physicists. Yeah, there is one particular episode where the main character Sheldon is asked to lie and therefore he decides to move out of the, uh, of the flat that they, he shares with his roommate Leonard and then uh, Leonard asks why are you moving out and uh, then Sheldon says that there doesn't have to be an answer because either the reason is predicated on a sub reason which is again predicated on another sub reason and leading to an infinite regression or uh, it tracks back to arbitrary axiomatic statements or it, the argument is ultimately circular, which means that I am moving out because I am moving out. <laughs> okay. So, uh, have you experienced this kind of thing when two, two people argue? If you are fighting, with, having a fight with your friends or your parents, yeah, then ultimately, who wins? How do you decide that? Yeah, can you keep arguing? I am saying this, yeah, I am saying that attendance in this class is compulsory, you can ask why, then I will give you another reason, then again you can question that reason, then again you can question that reason and the series never ends, right. So, I am going to add a page and say that, okay, so suppose A0 is my reason, I need support for A0, right, so I can get it from A1. Support for A1, I can get it from A2 and then how far can I go? Yeah, this is infinite regression. Okay, so modulo, I am using the word uh, infinite, but modulo, our understanding of the word infinite. Okay, this is the first possibility. Second thing is that A0 relies on A1, but ultimately A1 relies on B and B is something that we all agree on, okay, so B is like an axiom, we do not question B, yeah, similar, um, it is exactly similar to how we never question what the color of my t-shirt is, yeah, it is white, all of us agree on that and that has defined white in our eyes, 
Okay, so this is uh, leads to axioms. Axioms are precisely those statements which we never question. And the third possibility is that, okay, A0 relies on A1, A1 relies on A2, A2 relies on A3 and A3 relies on A. Yeah, this does happen between friends. Yeah, you start arguing and then ultimately the arguments are circular. Now, tell me in practical situations, which of these is useless? First one, yes, the first one is useless because we don't have infinite lifetime. Yes, our life is finite, so we cannot continue arguing. Yeah, that's not what uh, we are here for. So we don't use the infinite regression argument and the circular argument actually, I mean, it justifies itself. So in mathematics, at least we shouldn't be using the third option either. That's also like the infinite. Yes, the third one is also infinite regression, but it also, uh, it's self-fulfilling, <laughs> yeah. So it's different from the previous one. So that's why in mathematics, we always choose the second option. This is actually called, this is a philosophical principle. This is Munchausen's trilemma. That whenever we want to argue, then there are different types of options. These are the three. I mean, whenever we want to reason. So there are three different ways of reasoning. Yeah. And okay, in mathematics, we always assume the second one. We have to talk about some things which are axioms and then we never question them. Okay. Uh, perhaps, oh, I mean, this is cir circular. I should finish writing this. Uh, this is eventually circular. So Munchausen's trilemma was not really introduced by Munchausen. It was introduced by Hans Adler or Albert, maybe Albert in uh, the 20th century. However, the character Munchausen, if you Google it, yeah, and I strongly recommend you do that, then the ca fictional character of Munchausen uh, can be seen in a picture. Yeah? He has uh, Baron Munchauser, if I remember the name correctly. Then he has uh, long hair and he is stuck in a swamp. Yeah, it's a story. He does absurd things. So now uh, swamp is pulling, it do pulling him down. So he is pulling his own hair to get out of the swamp. Okay, so that's the picture. You can see that if you Google uh, this on... Then uh, on Wikipedia, you can see that picture, which is com completely absurd. Yeah, you cannot pull yourself out, but he claims in that story that you can. Okay, so these are uh, based on that story. Uh, ultimately, these three things were written and we will choose this for our axiomatic systems. The first thing that we will assume without question is the notion of a set. Okay. Right now, I mean, at least at the beginning of the course, we don't have an answer to this question. In the second part of the course, where we'll study logic, after studying logic, you will understand what is the notion of a set. But for now, we don't ask this question. Okay, so the notion of a set is undefined at the moment. Okay. So, uh, maybe let's continue with some fun. I will tell you more about set theory and who introduced it, some history and what we can do with it. So, uh, how many of you have heard of the Hilbert's hotel problem? Okay, comparatively lower number. So those who know don't speak. Those who don't know should speak. Yeah. Uh, so there is a hypothetical hot shell. Yeah, it's called Hilbert's hot shell because Hilbert gave this idea. And uh, there are there is one room in that hot shell for every natural number. Oh yes, by the way, we are doing set theory and logic. So 
the set of natural numbers always contains 0. No matter what your other professors tell you, in this class, 0 is a natural number. Yes. 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, we will always use 0. Set theorists will always assume this. Okay. Okay, so uh, I am saying that for every natural number, there is a room in that hotel. Now, a new, uh, so suppose one day, yeah, there is some event happening and therefore all the rooms are full and a new guest arrives. The guest is tired and he requests that, please provide me with a room. And then the manager says that, no, there is no room available, all the rooms are filled. And then he says, that's impossible, I can tell you a way to give me a blank room. And he says that shift every person to the next numbered room, so that room number 0 will be empty. Right? Now, this idea can be done finitely many times. Can you do it if there are more natural number many new customers? Yes, how? How will you shift them? We know how to create space in the initial segment of natural numbers. Yeah, you just push them. What else can you do if there are natural number many new customers? Okay, so you use the function, right, x mapping to 2x from natural numbers to natural numbers and then all the odd numbered rooms are available. So will this hotel ever run out of rooms? What if there are real number many new customers arriving? Can you fit them inside natural numbers? Right, so uh, there is a notion of cardinality. Even though we don't want to define what is cardinality, we at least understand the comparison. Yeah, in this course, we will definitely prove that cardinality of real numbers is true to the cardinality of natural numbers. Right, so it's, a, it's in bijection with the power set of natural numbers. So, it is going to be strictly bigger. And this is the uh, famous Cantor's theorem. Yeah, cardinality of the power set is strictly bigger than the cardinality of the set itself. And then coming back to the history of this, so who introduced set theory? So Cantor, yeah, George Cantor, he is uh, the, so usually uh, any mathematical subject is not really discovered by one person. Yeah, it, ideas are around for quite a few years and then somebody combines those ideas and uh, something new is formed. However, Cantor in I think 1874 or eight, uh, 1874, yes, he published a paper on the collection of algebraic numbers real algebraic numbers yeah, and he used the word collection, he did not coin the term set, but that is the considered to be the birth of set theory and ultimately, I mean there are many names uh, like Dedekind involved, but ultimately the one that we currently use is called zermelo frankel set theory which is also known as ZF th set theory. You must have heard of ZFC, ZFC axioms, yeah, so we are not going to talk about C yet, C stands for choice, yeah, that is a very interesting topic in it itself. So zermelo frankel set theory, ZFZ theory, it tells you what you can do. So there are two different types of axioms in zermelo frankel set theory, there are 10 axioms in total. I mean, not axioms, uh, axiom schema, yeah, no, one axiom is not really an axiom, it is axiom schema. So, uh, 
some of them are existential axioms which means they guarantee the existence of certain sets and the other ones are axioms which tell you how to build new sets from existing ones. Okay, so I am going to write something on the board and see if that makes sense to you. Like reading these kinds of symbols is also another purpose of, of this course. So I am just going to write this. Uh, sorry, uh -huh. undo. Can you read this? There exists x such that for all y, not y is in x. What does it say? I mean, you literally transliterated it right now, yeah, from mathematical language to English language. But what does it say? Sorry? Empty set. Uh, what is empty? X is empty. Okay, okay. So this is the axiom of the empty set. This is the first and most important axiom. Yeah, if you don't have this, then perhaps you will not be able to build anything. So what this axiom guarantees that there exists a set that doesn't have any elements. How do we normally denote this kind of set? Yes, I was expecting that answer. However, the answer is not phi. It's a Norwegian letter. Okay, phi is a Greek letter. It's a Norwegian letter and it's written with a slight slanted line. Okay, so don't call it phi. So it is, uh, this is our notation for empty set. Yeah, uh, Let us just call it the empty set always, yeah, not phi. Okay, so then there are some more axioms, I can write down a few more, but using those axioms you can convert, like can construct new sets out of the existing ones. So for example, there is something called uh, the axiom of power set. Yeah, so from this you can like construct the power set of empty set. How many elements will it contain? One. Yeah, you understand because empty set has zero elements. So the power set of the empty set has one element. Then uh, maybe you can also consider this. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to answer the first question. What is number three? Yeah, so these are called uh, von Neumann ordinals. So 0 is defined to be the empty set, 1 is defined to be the set consisting of empty set, 2 is defined to be the set consisting of 0 and 1. Okay? I mean this is uh, empty set as well as the set consisting of empty set. So, you can observe that this is singleton 0, this is 0, 1, then now our questionable number 3, yeah, where number 3 is empty, then singleton empty and then the set containing empty and the singleton empty, which is actually 0, uh, uh, 1 and 2. So, 0, 1, 2 are just symbols here, then this is 3. In general, you know what n is now. n is the collection of 0, 1, 2, n minus 1. And then the set of natural numbers, right? So that is guaranteed by this axiom of infinity. I will not write it right now, but the set of natural numbers, which we will not write using this notation, but we will use the notation omega 
for that that consists of 0 1 2 n and dot 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 everything that we have constructed using this procedure. So, these are our numbers from starting from axiom of infinity we are so this course is not called axiomatic set theory and logic ok this is only naive set theory. So, even though I will tell you a bit about some axioms there will be no questions in the exam based on that yeah you should be able to read those axioms yeah but there will be no explicit questions about them. So, look at the irony of this construction of natural numbers. What did we start with? What did we start with? The empty set and what is there in the empty set? Nothing. So, everything is created out of nothing. Okay, that is how set theory is built. Okay, so, this is the, I mean you can either call it beauty or stupidity, it depends on you, but that is how set theory is built. Empty set is uh, our starting point for everything and actually in zermelo frankel set theory, we would not be able to build too many different things apart from these. Yes, do you have a question? Huh, what is the confusion? So, like we came till n and what is the w? That is not w, it is called omega. Okay. Huh? It is a Greek letter omega. Omega is the first infinite ordinal. Yeah, I will perhaps write down that name. But omega is the set consisting of 0, 1, 2, 3 and whatever we have constructed so far. And that is actually the model for natural numbers. See, in set theory when you talk about natural numbers then actually you assume, I mean in logic, then you assume that natural numbers are equipped with your shift function n mapping to n plus 1 or addition and multiplication. So, it is more of an algebraic construct. In set theory we do not need the algebra, we need only the order theory part of it, right. So, the order theory part is omega. Ordinal stands for, uh, so these are I mean these are all called von Neumann ordinals. Yeah, so this is the first infinite ordinal. Now what is the purpose of uh, ordinals? So, uh, they are used for ordering, right. If I ask some of you to come here on the stage and stand in a line, then I can say first person, second person, third person, right. That is how we order things. At that time, we are not really counting. Counting and ordering are two different purposes of numbers. So, ordinal uh, uh, denotes that our purpose is ordering and not counting. Cardinals on the other hand they are used for counting. Any questions so far? Ok, so uh, then let us do something new. So, can you give me ways to construct new sets from the existing ones. <coughs> yes, if I am given two sets, what can I do to get a new set? Yes, union, union. okay. What is union? Loudly, come on. The, are you so afraid that all your answers will be wrong and all of them are philosophical, so you do not want to answer? <laughs> yes, what is, what is the union of two sets? Every element that belongs to A. Okay. To How should I write that? First, 
For all x, no, I don't want to use the notation for all x. Can I write it in the set builder notation? Pair of x comma y. Pair of x comma y. For union. X. I should just write x such that x belongs to a or okay. Yeah, no pairs are required here. Unions means simply you collect elements from both sets. I will ask you a simple question. What about the set consisting of 1, 2 and the set consisting of 1, 3? What is their union? Very good. Now I am getting loud voice. Yeah, 1, 2, 3. Why can't it, I write it as 1, 1, 2, 3? What is not the property of sets? Set does not repeat the same number. Actually, it is never mentioned. Right? In Zermelo Frankel set theory, you never say that these two sets are actually equal. So, the highlight of this is this or, okay? And then I am going to give you a new axiom to deal with this dilemma. It is called axiom of extensionality. What does it say? I will uh, write this statement down. Okay. So, for all x, for all y uh, and for all z. So, if we have the property that z is an element of x, if and only if, z is an element of y. Yeah, if we have this property for all z's, then actually this is the same thing as x equal to y. So, we are actually defining what is the meaning of equality of two sets. What does it say? That if they have the same elements for all z, z belongs to x if and only if z belongs to y. If that happens, then we say x is equal to y. And if x is equal to y, then they have the same elements. Okay, that is how it is defined. Now, check that with these two. Right? This element 1 is already uh, contained on the other side. Even though I have written them twice, it does not really matter. Right? These are the same sets. We are not doing talking about multi sets. Yeah? As sets, they are the same. So, it would not matter. Actually, now uh, I am thinking about something new. Can you observe that I have written some x here? Yes. So, that x, where is it coming from? I mean, I am sure you are used to writing x in real numbers such that something, something happens. Yeah, but where is the x coming from in this definition when you are talking about a and b? X is either coming from a or either coming from b. Yes, so that is a property it should satisfy that x should come from a or x should belong to b. But a priori, I mean, I should check this property for all x's. Yeah? If that x satisfies this property, then I will put it in a union b. But what x's? Should I check this property for? What? All the natural numbers. No, uh, A and B are arbitrary sets. They are not from natural numbers. So, what property should I uh, like? Uh, from where should I choose X? Huh? From the union set. set. Universal set. What is a universal set? So from the codon. Which codomain? There is no function here. What is a universal set? <laughs> that is how set theory is taught in schools. Correct? There is a universal set and then you check everything for the universal set. If that particular element satisfies some property, then you say it is put in the union, otherwise it is not. However, there is no such notion of a universal set because universe can always be expanded. If you 
if u is the universal set then 2 to the u means the power set of u also exists its power set also exists so there is no end to that process so actually x is any set normally what you are used to is saying that sets are denoted with capital letters and uh, elements are denoted with small letters however there is no distinction between sets and elements we are talking about the class yeah i'm using a particular term it's also mathematical we are talking about the class of all these sets and we are defining a relationship binary relationship between sets themselves so i should ideally write down a union b yeah i mean I, I shouldn't really care about this i should write down a union b equal to all those x's such that x belongs to a or x belongs to b there is no real distinction between sets and elements and i hope that was also clear from this particular slide you can see that empty set is zero one is singleton empty set but one is a set and one is also an element of two and three and all of them so there is no distinction between elements and sets so in tomorrow's class we will uh, continue with constructing new sets yeah continue with knife set theory for a while